we'll wait just a minute, if that's all right. I'll introduce myself in the meantime. I think most of you are here, having looked at the book, and know that my name is Bruce Selleck. I'm a professor of geology here at Colgate. Um, I'm also a member of the class of 1971, Colgate graduate. I've been teaching at Colgate for 36 years now. This was my 36th. Hard to believe. Um, so I went to graduate school, came back, been here ever since, uh, and so have a, a, a pretty long-term connection to the institution. And uh, so this topic of energy, sustainability, what it means for Colgate and the larger upstate New York region, and just as an aside, I, I, I grew up actually on a dairy farm up about 20 miles from the St. Lawrence River in upstate New York, the real upstate New York, not this. This is, <laughs> this is not upstate. This is central New York. And uh, so I have kind of a, a, a long-term connection to the region. And so what we're going to talk about this morning, um, and we're going to start, I, I, I handed around a document, which is, and I'm going to flip off this beautiful scene, uh, which could have been taken, you know, this morning. Um, actually, no, it couldn't have been because the sun is in the southwest, so this is mid-afternoon, but never mind. Um, Vini taught me that. Uh, the document that I handed around comes from a uh, something that everyone who cares about energy, economy, environment should read absolutely every year. It's a long document. This is called the International Energy Outlook. It is put out by the U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Information Agency, the, the e D-O-E-E-I-A, and they do this as an annual report that's published on energy use both in this country and globally. It has various cuts through uh, both by uh, world uh, Rob Otto. Good. How are you, buddy? Good. It's good to see you. As usual, you're late to class, but that's right. <laughs> Going from downtown. You made that, that walk many times late at night, right? Back in the day. <laughs> and th th this is something, I, I, I say this to the students, and I, I teach a course called, um, well, it's called Earth Resources, which includes a, really about two-thirds of what we do in that class is about energy and energy alternatives and energy sources. But this is a, a fundamental document uh, that I er encourage students to become familiar with. and. Um, what you have in uh, the, the handout that I uh, passed around, and I don't, John, how are you? Some more latecomers, but uh, that's all right. Uh, they don't get copies of the handout, so, because I ran out. Yeah. Uh, but w what I handed around is what's called, it's the highlights, uh, and really this is a, where the EIA does their annual forecast of U.S. and then global energy demand. And if you look at that first page, and this is, okay, wh what is the EIA? Well, they are um, scientists, economists. Uh, people who come from oil and gas, electricity, other energy companies, from utilities, from the transport, uh, uh, transportation uh, uh, sector, and either as consultants or directly hired by the Department of Energy, prepare this annual report. Interestingly enough, because of budget cuts back, this is one of the areas that we're going to see less data availability, at least as quickly as it has been in the past. This, by the way, is it's a fantastic website to learn about, in all kinds of ways, energy and the way we can understand its flows, its sources, and past patterns, current trends, and uh, future projections. 
the topic that we're going to focus down on here in a few minutes is about Colgate and Colgate Energy and Colgate Energy Resources and its relationship to our regional, uh, regional opportunities for energy development. Uh, but there, there, there is stuff in here which we all need to be aware of, even as we think on a scale as local as Colgate University in Hamilton, New York. And that is, and this is, yeah, I, I highlight this, I think, uh, again later on, this is EIA's projections going forward to 2035, and it's uh, hard to read in the back, but for those of you who have, you have a copy of the same thing, um, this is total energy growing, and the total energy growth, uh, there's detail in here, in their model based upon 2007. Now, this is the 2010. Richard Beck, how are you? How are you, Bruce? Good to see you. Um, this is their projection from 2007 moving forward that incorporates data, of course, from uh, more recent years and just trends forward. And in there is a total energy consumption globally. The unit is quadrillion BTUs, you know, z uh, 200 quadrillion BTUs or quads. Uh, total energy consumption is to grow by about 50% between 2007 and 2035 based upon the best guesses, guesses, these really, really are estimates based upon current patterns and then regulations and policy. Very important to note that the folks at EIA who look at all the data globally have renewables growing at about the same rate or slightly less than the rate of total energy consumption. And you need to note that natural gas, coal, and petroleum liquids all grow at about that same rate or slightly more rapidly than renewables. This was done in uh, late 2010. They showed nuclear increasing by a smaller, uh, at a smaller growth rate, but still increasing. That's an open question, as we all know, based upon what just happened in Japan. The takeaway that I try to present to students, so you know kind of where we're going, uh, where I go with this a little bit up front, is no matter what you read in the papers or watch on TV, depending upon which TV uh, news input you watch or what, uh, what web sources you, uh, you, you, you rely upon, we're going to be taking oil and gas and coal out of the ground for the next number of decades. We are highly dependent upon fossil fuels for our transportation sector, obviously. We are very dependent upon fossil fuels for energy generation in this country. Something on the order of about 70, 68 to 70 percent of our total electrical energy comes from fossil fuel, mostly coal, although shifting to natural gas. So that's the backdrop. Uh, and what I'd like to do is, you know, if folks, uh, I tend to get going on stuff, but please do interrupt me, ask questions, disagree with me, yell at me. Um, um, but, but the fundamental takeaway I have, and, uh, you know, I'm a geologist, and I think geology is important, and I think that students, it's important for students to take geology to understand how the earth works, but it's also um, and I advise students, current students, don't turn your back on the oil and gas industry, the fossil fuel industry. It's going to be very lively for a long time. And um, the demographics of that industry in terms of the uh, folks employed in oil and gas, particularly right now, is very interesting because there are a lot of folks hired in the 70s in, in the, you know, in uh, the, the, the first uh, Gulf oil crisis back in, in the, the 1970s, there was global uh, hiring of, of geologists, geophysics, geotechnical people, petroleum engineers. Most of those people are of my generation, and they're getting ready to retire if they've not always uh, already done so. And all the things that surround oil and gas. We'll talk a little bit about uh, gas shale and, and some of those issues later on. So that's, that's the kind of backdrop that I have for uh, this. And the, the other important um, and let me just thing to note in this is 
is that um, here's the, this is petroleum in million barrels a day projected forward that uh, one of the things that we will see increasing more than that's OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, and non-OPEC, that what we call unconventional sources of petroleum. And if you're not aware of the Bakken shale, the Eagle Ford shale, those, uh, the Eagle Ford's in Texas, the Bakken is up in uh, North Dakota and uh, Eastern Montana and over into the adjacent provinces of Canada. That is emerging as a major liquid source as are tar sands right now in, in northern uh, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. Those environmental impacts, particularly related to tar sands, are quite profound. Nevertheless, there are huge reserves of what we call non-conventional or unconventional uh, petroleum liquids in the ground. Question is, can we extract those uh, with relatively minimal uh, environmental harm? Um, yes, Thurza. Just yesterday, for the very first time, saw a commercial for one of the big oil companies about these sands. Yeah. yeah. We're able to get that. I, I forget whether that was ExxonMobil. I think it might have been, but they are, are finding or they have a safe way now to. Well, I think if you listen to what the guy says, that we're able to get this, these uh, crude oil, extract these crude oil out of tar sands with no more environmental impact than most other petroleum sources. I mean, if you look at, you can go to Google Earth and find those images of the areas up in, um, in northern Saskatchewan and, or northern Alberta in particular, the uh, Fort McMurray uh, deposits. And they're big areas. This is a surface mining technique. It's like strip mining, basically, except the stuff that you're taking out is actually a little more uh, chemically active than coal, so you've got a, a little more problem, uh, and it also takes some energy to, to extract the tar, the, 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 the crude oil, ultimately. Nevertheless, we have significant unconventional resources, so that's a takeaway. We're going to be dependent upon fossil fuels in spite of significant gains in what we tend to think of as green and sustainable resources. Um, Natural gas production will continue to increase, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, coal consumption, and again, this is the EIA projection. North America, rest of the world, non-OECD Asia. Third takeaway point, yes, China is investing significant resources in hydropower and wind and they are increasing at significant rates their energy or electric, uh, electrical uh, production capacity from those renewable sources. However, they are building coal-fired electric plants at a much greater rate. This is basically China plus India uh, and to a lesser degree the, uh, South Korea and uh, some of the other Southeast Asia states. So the rest of the world, North America, very little increase in coal production. And of course, coal is the fuel source that produces by far the most CO2 per unit of heat that's generated. So when we worry about global CO2, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you know, whatever your take is on what you think about global climate change and warming associated with greenhouse gases, pumping more CO2 into the atmosphere is probably not the best thing to do. However, growth, economic growth will demand significant new coal-fired electrical sources, at least in, the, in our current understanding. So that's case three. So when people say, you know, China's doing all this wonderful stuff with wind power, yeah, but they're getting most of their energy, new energy from coal. And they're importing it from all over uh, the Pacific Rim, uh, particularly from Australia. That's why companies like uh, uh, BHP Billiton and Rio Tinto have significant investments in those fields. Um, 
this chart, and, I, and I'll, I'll stop this soon, but this is just net electrical generation by fuel. The purple bar here is coal, and it's just important to note that in terms of these projections over the next 25 years, coal will significantly grow. Uh, this is growth in biomass, solar, and geothermal, excluding wind and hydropower. These are very small numbers compared to those others, but there are projections of significant growth. And again, I just want to say, this is, uh, when I give uh, the talks of this sort, I am not advocating this as policy for the future. This is simply projections that are made based upon current trends, past uses, and regulations and economic forces that are at play currently. People say, well, you're, you know, you're, you're a cheerleader for the oil and gas industry. And to some degree, I suppose that's true. But the reality is um, fossil fuels remain a, will remain a significant energy source. Before you leave that chart. Yes. The green bar, they talk about, it includes several items. Biomass. Waste. Tidal wave. Yeah. Uh, is there any way to break those out in the green bar? There, I'm sure there is in detail in, in the report itself. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are developments going on. And, uh, you know, I'm going up to the Bay of Funday later this summer to look at some of those in Maine, well, in uh, coastal Maine and in Nova Scotia. Uh, geothermal is, uh, you know, there are limits. Uh, solar, there are limits. Um, right now, the big limit is, of course, cost. And um, industrial sector growth, this is, uh, these are basic, th this is China and India, Brazil, the non-OECD economically developed countries, but its definitions need to be changed. This is the US and, and Western Europe and Japan, basically. So, in, you know, the scale of growth of energy use in the industrial sector. So this is, uh, I, I present this as basically not something that we need, we can possibly digest in the time we have is merely to point out that this is a fantastic source of information about energy that all all concerned human beings should read annually it's 839 pages a lot of it is text and data you can go to their website if you just do uh, Google DOE EIA annual uh, energy and you'll pop up with all sorts of stuff to look at. Yes. Uh, if you look at the OECD portion of the uh, industrial consumption, it, it's reasonably flat across there. Right. right. And yet one assumes that, that, that there is uh, an increase in industrial production. Right. I mean, it's efficiency gains. Uh, exactly. So in fact, within the right. OECD, there are uh, efficiency gains that are, that are keeping consumption uh, uh. Right. If we look at if we look at the the basically the energy cost per unit of GDP is uh, is a measure that we commonly use. So we look at you can look at the global GDP. You can look at individual countries. You can look at individual sectors. Uh, industrial uh, being the big one, and the the unit uh, the, the units of energy consumed per unit of GDP. That's a a negative number. That is, we become more efficient with time in terms of. It even normalized uh, units of economic production uh, held constant against, say, 2000, we, we get more efficient, particularly in the OECD countries. But, but growth in those highly populated developing and rapidly developing countries drive the red bars there. In their, in their case, they will be, become more efficient per unit of GDP produced. So right. The rate of increasing in, in, in production. So with that, I, you know, just to point, and again, this is something that's available. That's the actual document is downloaded. It's the US EIA Energy International Outlook. And that is, uh, to me, for, and I say this to students, again, Become familiar with that and don't be afraid to look at it 
often and every year if you think about these issues and you think about environmental issues because that's the background that's what's driving that's those are the the current uses that drive all the issues that relate to energy uh, are embedded in the data that's presented in that report so we'll turn now and take a take a look at um, Colgate and I I had this slide up here before this is a marvelous view of the campus June uh, and it reminds us of a couple of things. First of all, that Colgate sits in a very rural area. We all know that, but just to appreciate it, if you look across the hilltops off to the southeast there, you see mostly woodlands, very little agricultural land, very little pasture, very few buildings, very few houses. Colgate in this part of, of central New York is part of what we sometimes call the northern forest. It is really not any more an agricultural center. Certainly agriculture is locally important to the economy, but mostly what goes on here is trees are growing. And that's a good thing. <laughs> We're capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. We are storing it. We are also making, um, we, we don't have anything to do with it. The ecosystem is sitting there making highly valuable commodities in the form of wood and wood we call biomass when we burn it, but we also use it in a, a whole bunch of other ways, including hopefully someday down the road, possibly making uh, on a large scale ethanol as a motor fuel using cellulosic technologies, which have remained somewhat difficult to break through. But in any event, uh, that's, that's the reminder uh, slide. And I, get, I give this a talk in a variety of forms, uh, in a variety of places. I get a variety of responses. Uh, it's, it's interesting how folks come to the table when we talk about energy. In this kind of buzzword sustainability, uh, there's a lot of different definitions of sustainability out there. Uh, by many definitions, what we are doing right here today is absolutely unsustainable. Uh, the energy that we all use getting here, the energy that we use to build this building, to maintain the place, the energy that we use to drive systems which allow us to live the way we do, many would claim uh, there are definitions of, of sustainability that would have us be defined as unsustainable. And certainly because the U.S. consumes about a quarter of the uh, global energy and uh, resources, although that percentage will decline as India and China increase their rates of energy uh, consumption, uh, we, we, we still do uh, consume a lot of stuff. Uh, cost is the other factor. And th to me, um, and you know, I've, I've been at Colgate a long time. I care about the institution's financial uh, stability. Uh, I've been in the Dean Provost office and on various committees where we worry about uh, how, what we spend our money on. And we'd much rather spend our money on students and uh, the things that serve students, including faculty and buildings like this and libraries, uh, and the less we can spend on energy, the better. So energy efficiency, but also what, how the mix of energy that we use to drive the campus and how that might, that those cost factors might be constrained is, is, is I come at it from, if you can lower the amount of money you're spending on energy to the absolute minimum level, you're probably going to be using less energy and be some way closer to sustainability. I talked about this before. I'm just going to jump through it. Uh, fossil fuels, that's the takeaway. Um, we didn't talk much about natural gas and will a little bit, but uh, I want to say, I will say some more about natural gas at the end and, and talk about some of the issues related to natural gas extraction, what we ca call c unconventional natural gas, including gas shale in the area. Um, if you're not familiar with Boone Pickens' stuff on energy, he's got a bunch of really good stuff, or there is a website that has a bunch of good stuff on his th way of thinking through energy transitions over the next few decades. And I'm I'm a big proponent of really thinking through how we can transition, particularly in the transportation sector, from liquid fuels, hydrocarbon fuels, to natural gas, potentially to electricity, assuming that there are various kinds of breakthroughs on, along the way. We also need to think about how we're going to generate that electricity. And just by the way, 
I think abandoning nuclear power is stupid. Uh, it's got all kinds of hazards associated with it, but so does everything else that we do. So um, I think we need to be, and, and, and nuclear power, this is a cost competitive uh, sort of chart. How much, you know, things like offshore wind, solar uh, photovoltaic, solar thermal, in terms of sources of energy are relatively costly compared to many of the new uh, combined cycle and carbon capture or combined cycle systems that we can do with natural gas where we're generating both electricity and we're generating steam for use in uh, heating buildings and so forth. But there are big concerns about nuclear. I give talks all over the place more and more all the time about this issue which I mentioned, which is artificial hydrofracturing and natural and, and in the Marcellus Shale, which is a big buzzword here in the immediate, I would say, northeast region uh, from Ohio to West Virginia to Pennsylvania into New York. We currently have a moratorium on that, and I'm, I, I, I'll leave some time at the end to talk more about that particular issue. But I use this slide in all these talks to remind folks, remind the audience that we need energy here in the Northeast because it gets cold in the winter and we need to heat our buildings. This is a, a shot, uh, actually a, a, a space shuttle image taken in December of 2006, uh, just after a cold front breakout. And you see the streamers of clouds coming off Lake Ontario. That's the lake effect snow. You see the front pass down through here, Delaware, New Jersey. Long Island dusting that with snow. It gets cold here. Currently, particularly in the urban areas like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, natural gas is a big source of energy for residential and commercial heat. If we can get gas from here, that's the Appalachian Basin, rather than from, well, Louisiana or Alberta or Wyoming, it's a lot cheaper. And it's cheaper at the city gate. It's cheaper uh, for, it's, there's more money to be made in development. And uh, it's an advantage to have this local source. Of course, the issues up at the top that are raised by the very title of that slide um, have caused New York to put a moratorium currently on developing the Marcellus Shale using horizontal drilling and hydrofracturing techniques. And I said, I'll, we'll talk more about that, that at the end. Okay, Colgate. Um, I learned some time ago that compared to many other similar sized institutions, Colgate has a real advantage in where we are located in our energy sources. We kind of live in an energy nirvana Part by, partly by good luck, partly by good planning done by some smart people back in the, well, really back to the 1950s. We have uh, Hamilton Village as a municipal utility, and obviously Colgate is their biggest customer. And an MUC here in New York State is a public utility corporation that has definite boundaries, has certain legal limitations as to what, what and how they can sell their product and maintain their infrastructure. But the important advantage is that these small municipal utilities can buy currently from the New York State Power Authority. And that's one of these authorities that exist in New York State. If you're not familiar with them, they're kind of an unusual entity, relatively unusual uh, compared to other states. The Power Authority of the State of New York right now directed by a Colgate graduate by the name of Richie Kessel, who was uh, also a member of the class of 1971 and actually lived across the hall or lived across the bathroom from me <laughs> for one semester my junior year. Uh, Rich is an interesting guy. Uh, they, uh, Colgate or the municipal utility gets New York State Power Authority electricity that is Hydro, think Niagara and the St. Lawrence power development. Nuclear, uh, basically the power authority buys nuclear power from the utilities that own the plants on the Lake Ontario shoreline. It also buys wind power and it's sold back to municipal uh, utilities at, in that case for the wind and the nuclear, at a bit of a discount. So we get cheap power. It's about 85% non-fossil fuel. 
because of that. So when we do our calculation of carbon footprint, we have this immediate advantage that has really not so much to do with any policy decision that Colgate has made, that the institution has made. It's rather that um, we have this real fortunate kind of happenstance. The MUC came into existence in the 1950s, uh, short, uh, really shortly after the Second World War. And Colgate has been a, a very important partner in that, in particularly in terms of helping to maintain infrastructure and assuring that we're buying electricity so that the, the market uh, is there for the MUC. Um, but, you know, like anything else, we're, we're a, a price depression in the midst of a rising tide of price, and so someday we're going to get flooded. Um, another uh, important thing that happened back in 1986 um, was that uh, then uh, it was uh, would have been Ray Creel and Austin Jerger. Ray Creel was then a treasurer, uh, convinced the board and the president that we ought to move forward with a uh, a wood chip fired system. This was kind of unknown technology, at least at institutional scale. Uh, here it, it, at, at the level of colleges and universities, certainly big uh, paper mills and sawmills and those kinds of industries had been using um, uh, steam from wood chips for, for generations or a couple of generations. But we did that, and so we get about 85 or 90 percent of the main campus, that is the buildings that are not on Broad Street, um, but the, 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 the main campus buildings, uh, get their heat from the system, and we get most of that heat from uh, wood chips. We use currently number six fuel oil as a backup for that, say, other 15 percent, particularly during periods of uh, when it's real cold in the winter. We can't get quite enough heat out of that system. Um, we use number two fuel oil uh, to heat the basically Broad Street and the other outlying Colgate buildings. This, this difference uh, if you're not aware of it, number six is stuff that you can, you know, you can reach into a barrel of number six at ambient temperature and pull out a handful. It's sticky, uh, noxious, pretty rich in heavy aromatics. Um, we would like to not be using it anymore because both from a, just a handling perspective, it's, it's uh, an uncomfortable material and it's also got higher carbon uh, output than even number two. Number two is kerosene. Katie. Um, they come from local, or so I would say sub-regional, that is within, mostly within a 30-mile uh, radius. Um, and we actually have our director of sustainability, uh, John Pamilio, actually visits the sites, many of them. You know, it's, these are mostly, ideally, by waste from logging. Uh, and there are, pro there are plenty of forests for managed forests where which thinning. We have even at Colgate here old uh, softwood stands. They that go up, drive up to the Bucus Center, and on the left there, there are plantations of white spruce and uh, larch that were done 50 years ago that are not doing anything. They're not growing, they're not increasing, they're not capturing any new carbon. They should be thinned. So we, we do try as much as we can to control the quality and minimal, uh, minimize the impact of that uh, wood chip source. Our vehicle feed, fleet is gasoline. Yes. Uh, I'm not aware. Uh, <clears throat> Mayor Bloomberg uh, a month ago passed the bill <coughs> in New York City, which is going to phase out the use of number six fuel <coughs> oil in the next 15 years uh, to either go to number four or number two, but obviously, ideally, uh, to go to natural gas. We have a client right now who uh, had issues with his uh, number six fuel oil tank, which spilled oh, yeah. fuel. and. Um, Number six is bad stuff. Right, and through DC, you know, we're trying to negotiate to move towards natural gas. The problem, though, is that uh, the capacity for natural gas uh, in Brooklyn and Queens is not there yet. So it's it's difficult sometimes because uh, you want to, your client wants to do better for the environment or move away from number six to natural gas, where a company like National Grid doesn't have the capacity to actually provide it. So um, yeah, and I, I mean the transport, the infrastructure is a whole other transportation infrastructure and it's also interesting not to pick on New York City but the New York City Department of Environmental Protection came out with a very strong anti-hydrofracturing statement back 
uh, about a year ago. They did a quote analysis of the impacts, and so I mean these these are competing these are competing things that that, that where development of additional natural gas resources that would serve the urban market will require certain environmental impacts. Right, Schneiderman's filed the the brief on the Delaware River, uh, 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 the authority, the Delaware Basin Basin uh, Authority to. to state right. So it's it's a you know these are competing goods, and we have to keep our minds open and not take uh, positions which will be. Um, which shut down uh, discussion and shut and I would also say shut down opportunity because I have some views about that too. Bruce? Yes. The municipal that you're dealing with here in, in Hamilton, are you using are you using more than that is available through the municipal? Is, are you buying incremental power? Well, at times uh, the answer is no. Everything that we use in terms of currently electricity on the campus comes through the municipal, the Hamilton MUC grid. Agreed. Yeah. But we are sometimes exceeding in the winter the capacity for the cheap power that comes from the, the there is an upper limit to the amount of uh, electricity consumption that will assure that lower rate and sometimes the rate does jump up. But each of the municipals was given a certain quantity back when the contract was signed. Right. Are we exceeding Yes. Because we're, we're then paying the market rate for... Yes, and that's right. But that's not just quality, that's all of those. Agreed. But, it's a, but it turns out to be, right, right now, fortunately, a relatively small slice. So yeah, we, we do jump once we exceed that, and that's seen in my electrical bill. Okay. Any plan ahead of time to switch some of the vehicles to, uh, to help people? Not currently, but that's something I'd very much like to see, obviously. Bruce, um, yeah. at, at, as opposed to keeping an open mind, why doesn't Colgate take a position favoring a uh, horizontal drilling? We live in this well, I mean, yeah, in that's an interesting area. question. Should we be? Uh, why, why are we? You know, why are we? Why are we being? Professorial. New York City's not being professorial. Why don't we? Yeah, but we're not New York City. I, I think my, my own view is, is is very much, and I think that's important. Uh, my view is very much that we institutions like Colgate on issues like this need to be sources of information. That individuals like me can take a position. I have a position that's well known. Um, but I, but but for the university to take a position, a formal position. On something like this, or say this issue that was around a few years ago with Nairi, the New York Regional Interconnect yeah. proposal. What's the uh, Colgate comes out with a statement that says we support Nairi. Well, immediately we have some local and some segment of our alumni body who we pissed off. Didn't Colgate come out and support global warming? Or said that it was basically not supported. But Brian, said, good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. But basically said the university now accepts global warming as a de facto. No, no, no. no. We, we belong to. We, we. There is no statement like that. That we belong to this thing called the president's climate commitment, which is a. And I'm I'm going to flip to the next slide because it's really germane to that, which has, we do these comparisons. We have a committee which does this analysis, and we're looking to reduce our carbon footprint. But this is, this is where we are right now. And I just want to point out that we're already, compared to all these institutions, except for Bates, and I think they're probably lying. But that's all right. uh, we're already have, as measured by all the traditional, you know, there is a, a set of procedures that you go through to, to, to track back this out of all your energy consumption, all your, actually all your programs. And we, we, we do very well. This is, to some degree, for Colgate, um, refractory. That is very difficult to reduce anymore because most of that involves just what you guys did yesterday or the day before. You came here by 
airplanes and, 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 and cars, and that's how our students get here, that's how our faculty get here, that's how we go on study groups, it's how we travel across the country for geology field programs. Yeah. Transportation, actually, transportation fuel is our big source, and the question moving to, say, uh, compressed natural gas or liquefied natural gas for a vehicle fleet or even to electrical vehicle fleet for our local, say, on-campus vehicles, that would make a tiny bite in that. But as an you know, from the institutional perspective, what do you do? You want to you wanna have a uh, position, an institutional position that is, we're about education, and that's what we're trying to do here. To take an institutional position that says, we favor nuclear, or we favor wind, or we favor uh, you know, saving turtles in Afghanistan, we may, f as individuals or as, as subsectors of the campus, favor a number of those things. Yeah, but I think for economic development, right, part of the state. economic de and we do, and, the way you get and a component of that is natural gas development. Right. I agree with you 100. percent But but institutionally, you can be sure that there's some con and you, John, of all people, for crying out loud. I'm alone. <laughs> yeah, now yeah now you are right. Yeah, all right, good. Well, me too, but I still have to kind of think about the, the other parts of this. So, yeah, I mean, uh, both, both of these points really come around to from a policy or impact on policy perspective, should Colgate be doing this or that or the other thing? And I have to say, unless it's really something that we can have a meaningful impact on, or it really affects what we're doing as an institution in terms of educational programs, our ability to deliver our product, it's not a good thing to piss off a lot of people who might otherwise continue to support you. You know, think of some of the other things that we've done, John. That so what are some alternatives that we're looking at, that we continue to look at? Um, increasing, I mean, our current wood chip system does not meet the uh, total energy demand. We've talked about adding wood chip, chip capacity. It's cheap still in this area. Uh, it's cheaper than any other energy source for, for, uh, for heat, for, for making steam. We have some small things of thinking about willow and thinking about switchgrass. I don't think any of those are going to uh, play out. It's going to continue to be the things that grow best here, and that's trees. Trees grow. Um, and we can do that sustainably. Um, solar, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen and in any way that's going to impact. Uh, Bruce, before you yes. move on, uh, with your reference to Cogen, uh, you're talking about just the larger footprint of the plant well, or the larger footprint of the supply? Uh, the, 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 yeah, the market. To, 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 do syn, to do a big, and what do we mean by syngas? Most folks know, but you take the wood chips, you cook them, you produce a biogas, which is a mixture of methane and carbon monoxide. You pipe that, and hydrogen actually, you pipe that into a, a turbine. You generate electricity with it and use the by steam, the, the steam that's produced as a byproduct, to heat your campus buildings. To do it on a scale here, which is economical, we would need more than actually the campus, because you, you need a, the, the size of plant required to make this economic would actually produce more than we would need. So you would need to look at probably supplying steam to maybe the hospital, the school, maybe some new industrial park that sits up on Preston Hill neck across from John's house there. Um, or maybe the syngas plant goes, <laughs> maybe the syngas plant would go up there. That's actually a nice site for it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and it is the case that we have gone down the road thinking through some of those things, at least in a preliminary way. Um, I, I think it's actually an exciting thing because when we talk about employment and development, that's where you scale up and you're probably involving more producers and uh, some infrastructure there, too. Wind, um, I think we ought to have a big wind tower up on the hill here just because I, I like the way they look, but I don't want one in my backyard because I live out in Randallsville. <laughs> and that's the, that's the intersection of, um, 
We have had some wind power development. Those of you who go on the trip this afternoon, we're going to go up to the Fenner Wind Farm and just see the scale of those operations and what they look like. Uh, you know, there's an option there. Uh, we've looked at, in a prelimin very preliminary way, what we call uh, shallow geothermal. Uh, this is actually a possible, um, has some potential. I'd say it's modest for some of our small outbuildings. And you look at the real cost, if you compare number two fuel oil to um, shallow geothermal for, say, a building the size of, oh, the golf course, uh, the, the clubhouse at the golf course, it would make good sense, actually, right there, because we've got ground space to install shallow geothermal sources. You can't heat the campus with it. Uh, it hardly makes sense for any building that's much larger than that because of the scale issues. Um, you don't get any tax. I mean, COVID's not for profit, so. Yeah, we don't get it. You, you don't get the one third tax credit, which makes it. Makes it. Yeah, probably. Yeah, exactly. So we, we have to factor those things in. And, and it's, you know, the, the big thing here is that electricity, the big cost for shallow geothermal is all electricity once you've made the installation. As electricity cost goes up, that in, it, this will increase electricity demand versus, say, heating all those outlying buildings with number two fuel oil. So, that's and that's an issue for our local What's your cost per kilowatt up here? Uh, it's 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 <laughs> it's complicated. But any what? six, seven, eight cents, basically. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the school, not you yeah. and me. Yeah, yeah. not you and me. We pay nice, we play nicer. Yeah, you're on nice second so much, so. Yeah. Nine, nine. Uh, we we have night rate for a. Uh, it's nine, and yeah. then it's up to twelve and a half, thirteen, probably for the regular day rate. Yeah, I know. I mean, we're as I said, we're still living in this energy nirvana. Where would we put things? Wind towers. I'm going to jump along here. Trillium Mountain South Campus. That's up uh, up on the top, basically above the quarry, and also. The hills out by Bucus Center are places that at least have been looked at preliminarily. But the real alternative that we have in this region, just to fold this back, is natural gas. Um, right now, there is a study. Uh, the municipal utility has the regulatory authority to develop, to serve as a natural gas utility. The big potential, of course, is Colgate, the hospital, the high school, and then we have this small industrial park development on the north side of town out by the old airport or well it currently is an airport but that development we have some IDA industrial development authority money which has been helping us with that uh, we have the first phase study has just been completed I just received it the other day it looks promising and basically this would bring gas to the campus natural gas right now natural gas is the prices are depressed they're going to stay low for quite a while. I mean, I, there are people in the room who not, know a hell of a lot more about this than I do. But I, for all kinds of reasons here in the Northeast, and irrespective of what New York State does with the hydraulic fracturing moratorium, I mean, New York State, at the end of the day, in terms of the Marcellus, is going to be a tiny little piece of that entire play. There's money to be made, though, for people who own property and who might develop that gas. Um, there's going to be some requirements of investment. Um, there will be questions. We, we've, we've been approached probably over the last 30 years, 10 or 12 times by uh, gas companies, mostly small companies, wanting to drill on Colgate property. The, the, the amount of gas involved there is so small, but I think it, I would like to see it happen just to demonstrate that this can be done in, a, in an environmentally uh, sound way. And here, on, you know, here in the village and on campus, there are certainly members of this community who uh, have taken up the issue of hydraulic fracturing and natural gas development, and you know, they're waving the placards and putting the things on their front lawn, saying, you know, no frack or no drill, no drill, no spill, all this stuff. But we also have plenty of folks who are in favor of it. Lots of local landowners, geologists, unnamed geologists. Just to give you a perspective on this, um, where are the, we have currently a development uh, west of the village. And here's Hamilton Village. Here's Preston Hill Road. That's, where, uh, that's John Golden there. 
he looks across the valley. Well, just, you know, just to give everyone the perspective, right? He is, you said you were a local. I live, I'll show you where uh, my property is. It's uh, Parker Farm, River Road. We're, we're, right, we're right up here. And we have a cottage now on Crane Lake down there. So, and just up the hill from my house on River Road, there are two gas wells. In fact, if you go on the field trip, uh, we'll, we'll go visit those this afternoon. Here's the Bucus Center. This is the Lebanon and Bradley Brook fields. These are fields developed not in the shales. These are actually in a kind of unusual play. It's a unit called the Herkimer Sandstone. Remember uh, Herkimer Diamonds, Herkimer, New York, up to the north. Herkimer, in Herkimer, southern Herkimer County, the Herkimer Sandstone outcrops dips down to the south here. It's about 3,000 feet down, and it's developed. Um, these particular fields are developed where there are natural fractures in that otherwise tight sandstone. So they actually develop it by horizontal techniques. So Parker Farm and Bucus would be areas where, where we have been, are areas that we've been approached. And we basically, it's, we've not made a decision about leasing A because the amount of money involved is small. It may get a little bigger, it might be better to wait. The amount of gas that would be produced if it's a Herkimer, if these were Herkimer wells, would be small. It would have a tiny little impact on, you know, in terms of Colgate's uh, annual budget. I think it would be, my personal thing is, I would like to see it happen as an opportunity to demonstrate what this process is about and, and how it does. Um, we'll see the gas companies right now are, everyone in this region is in a wait and see circumstance. Uh, Norse has gathering lines. They have a compressor station up here that feeds into two, actually two different regional transmission networks. So everything here is connected by low pressure, 200 PSI or less gathering lines. And they feed in. And they have a trunk line now, which they're com or a major line, which they're completing, which will go south to the Millennium Pipeline, which is down by Binghamton, uh, north of Binghamton. The Iroquois line doesn't go anywhere near there, right? No, that's to the north. But we're... Um, but there is an infrastructure, and when, do, when we talk about bringing gas into the village, it's probably the Norse network, because they already have rights of way, that would be used to bring pipelines across to the village and ultimately to the campus, and that's part of that planning that's going on. And there's just a cartoon, just to show when I give this talk, a well around here, not to scale, and that's very important. This is much thicker than it's shown here. The wellhead is much smaller. Don't worry, this is not, the, the groundwater is a long way away. This is a, a cartoon of a, a horizontal well in this Herkimer sandstone, and the sandstone is naturally fractured. So they actually drill, it's, it's, it, you know, all this technology is cool, but they, you know, they do, do a diversion, which now is, um, ordinary, 15, 20 years ago, it was unusual, diversions to horizontals. And then uh, they just leave this hole open. It encounters natural fracture. It's not cased, it's, it's, not, it, it's open to fracture systems. And um, they've developed some ways of, they think, seeing this in, in new seismic. And they're really the only player in this, in this field. And this is uh, Colgate University. And if I turn around from the spot I took this picture, I could have seen that back in October of 2009, so a year ago this past fall. And if I go up there today, that's what I would see. So this is the drill, uh, the, the pad uh, with an active, this was a Herkimer well again, it was one of the Bramberger wells. And so this is about two and a half miles from campus up on the valley wall and the on the west side. And of course the issue, uh, you know, this is our local Progress Shenango, which is the Norwich area to the south where Marcellus development, it's really, it drives south from here towards Binghamton, you go through Norwich and then Oxford and then Green, and somewhere between Green and Oxford, the Marcellus gets deep enough that it will actually be potential to develop. Here in Hamilton, it's too shallow, it's too close to the surface, the formation pressures are too low. There is Utica Shale, which is another black shale lying beneath that may have potential. 
but we have this absolutely, um, I mean, from a, if, uh, if I were a social scientist, I would find this really interesting. As a natural scientist, I find some of the information appallingly awful that's presented, mostly on that side, but some on, you know, the oil and gas folks do uh, overstate. There's a lot of hyperbole. You know, anyone who's worked in this industry at all knows that there are risks of anything you do, whether it's a wind tower or a hydro dam, maybe even more nuclear, coal, oil and gas, biomass, you know, even, you know, generating methane gas from cow manure. People die when that happens because the gas explodes. So whatever we do, we're going to have... Uh, impacts both human and environmental. Okay. Um, I just thought of this. If you can go back to your previous slide, it's sort of a very technical question about um, the trajectory of the drilling. So yes. you said that the horizontal, um, is it just the horizontal piece that's not cased, or is it the entire thing? Oh, oh it, in, in, in one of these guys? No, it's just the horizontal section. Everything from yeah. basically, they only leave the open hole where there are fractures in the Herkimer. Everything else up here is cased, and then in New York we have pretty tight uh, cement and casing regulations for anything that's in the aquifer potential, which is basically uh, at least down to 750 feet below ground level. So this is all isolated completely, and there's, it's cased down this section as well. So only in that section would that be uncased. Now in the case of a hydro... A uh, hydraulically fractured well, this would be drilled, it would be cased with concrete internally, that means lining the hole, then you isolate segments and then you frack each of those segments by setting off basically burning small holes in the casing and then un having high pressure water and fracture fluid and propant in that segment of the well uh, of the horizontal and it blows out, fractures the shale and the gas comes out. That's a brine tank on the upper right, by the way. Uh, we're working, I have a student this summer and I, I actually an outfit from Texas A&M wants to come up here and uh, try out some new uh, cleanup techniques for taking that brine and turning it into a usable product. It's pretty interesting stuff. So there we go back and uh, I put this other one in here because these are just fantastic images of the campus and the village and then we look off and we say, we have to remember that Colgate is part of a larger, you know, global system and energy is a global issue and the environment is a global issue and let's work to find balance and not yell too much at one another as we try to get there. That's a nice thought, but I'm a dreamer. Apart, apart from energy generation, is Colgate doing anything regarding uh, energy efficiency within the, the existing buildings itself. Oh, yeah. Actually, as part of that, uh, I was on the, uh, the energy part of, or the campus energy part of the, this President's Climate Commitment. So we're going through, for instance, with lighting, changing lighting to lower electrical use. We're looking, we continue to look at upgrades to insulation. All the new renovations are done to a very high energy efficiency standard. Um, and new buildings, but we still have some of the older residences in here, East and West, and uh, Stillman. Uh, McGregory is really problematic. Huntington Gym is really problematic in terms of energy use, uh, in terms of just heat. It's, you know, if you've ever been in, up on the upper floors of Huntington Gym in the middle of the winter, you know, it's cold up there, yet we still have ice forming on the roof and sliding off killing people, so that's all interesting too. Thank you. A any other questions? Uh, I didn't hear any mention of fuel cells. Well, that's the hydro using hydrogen. Um, you got to get the hydrogen from somewhere, and if you really look at the what we call the well, that is the energy source, to wheels, that is whether you use it to drive car or um, you know make power for a building, fuel cells turn out to be really inefficient. They're great in the efficiency going from hydrogen to electricity, but to get the hydrogen you've got to take methane or you've got to take water and electro electrolyze it with electricity. 
So when we actually look at the total energy use, fuel cells, great for space shuttles, great for isolated you know, mining camps in, in, in Baffin Island, not great for running, for running infrastructure. Um, and you could, if you could get cheap hydrogen, hydrogen gas, they'd be great. But you gotta get the hydrogen. Hydrogen gas doesn't come alone. It always likes to be combined with something else, like oxygen or carbon. Okay, uh, if anyone wants to go on the trip this afternoon, uh, what we're gonna be doing is, I'm gonna just gonna pass this piece of paper, paper around, and I, I have in this van spots for 11 people. And anyone who wants to go is welcome. We're gonna leave from, well, anyone who can get their name on that sheet before it reaches 11. We're gonna depart from Hamilton down by the Student Union. It is a, uh, we'll be gone for uh, the better part of three hours. We're gonna go up and look at some of the wind farm. We're gonna look at actually the, the solid waste, make a quick kind of drive by the solid waste facility at uh, in Peter, near Peterborough, Fenner Wind Farm. We're gonna look at some Marcella Shale and talk about fracturing and natural fractures and hydraulic fracturing. There's a beautiful outcrop here. We're gonna go up and look at the gas well with a beautiful view back towards uh, Colgate, make a quick drive by the wood chip facility here. So if people want to do that, great. Um, If not, that's it. Thank you.